All right, everybody, welcome, welcome, thank you. Uh, welcome to Charles M. Bailey Library, the uh, this month's Lake Region series brought to you by the Library Foundation. Um, if you have not had the distinct pleasure to meet me yet. I am Lee Wilkinson, the new adult services librarian here. I started um, just before May, uh, I'm sorry, just before June. And uh, I'm happy to present and welcome here um, our two readers for this month's Lakes Region Forum. Um, uh, over to the far left of me, I've got Gretchen Legler. Um, and here to my near left is uh, uh, Julia Bausma. Um, Legler has taught and teaches creative writing and English at the University of Maine at Farmington. Uh, she is the author of Woods Queer, Crafting a Sustainable Rural Life, which was published by Trinity University Press. Um, her writing has earned two Pushcart Prizes, a notable essay designation in Best American Essays, and was a finalist for the Steinberg Essay Prize and the Publishing Triangle Judy Gron Award for Lesbian Nonfiction. Um, and Julia here, she is the sixth and current uh, Maine State Poet Laureate. Uh, she's the author of two poetry collections, Midden and Work by Bloodlight, both of which received the Maine Literary Award for Poetry. Uh, she has also received the Poets Out Loud Prize in 2016 and the Cider Press Review Book uh, Award in 2015. She currently serves as the library director in Webster Library in Kingsfield. Is that still accurate? Okay. And also teaches creative writing at the University of Maine in Farmington. That part's less accurate. Okay. <laughs> uh, any corrections will follow from them directly. And um, I will stop stammering and looking at my paper so you can enjoy the feature presentation. Thank you. So um, we're going to do a brief additions and subtractions to our bios. Um, so all the things Lee said are true. And I had the wonderful experience this spring of winning the main uh, literary award for memoir for this book. So um, there's a little sticker here to, to actually prove that I did that. Um, and also, in addition to the uh, award for memoir, the main book award for memoir, and the book also won the John Cole Award for Maine-based nonfiction. So I'm just so proud of that that I wanted to add, add that to my bio. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Thank you, Lee, for the wonderful introduction and the hospitality. I am, um, as a librarian, I really enjoy the chance to get to go to other libraries. Um, I really want to visit all the libraries in Maine before I'm done being Poet Laureate, and I probably won't manage because there are a lot, <laughs> but it's always fun to get to know, to go to a new one. Um, so I think what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to read some poems a little bit, and then Gretchen's going to read a little bit, and then we are going to talk maybe a little bit to each other, with each other, but definitely to answer questions and, and talk to all of you. Um, one of the best things for me about reading with Gretchen is that we always, first of all, she brings snacks in the car, like amazing <laughs> snacks, um, magnificent hummus and you know so I get to I get to eat snacks and then we have these wonderful conversations on the way to readings and so then I just sort of get here and I wing it based on whatever we've been talking about um but she had written we did a reading in in Phillips on Saturday and she took notes while I was talking and then read to me the things that I had said um <laughs> while we were driving here. And so one of the things that, that popped out was this phrase, beauty and brutality. 
So I think that I'm going to make that my temporary theme for tonight with the poems that I'm going to read. And I'm going to do this thing that the Gretchen has heard me do too many times now, which is I like to, I really like to begin readings with the last poem in my book, um, in my first book, Work by Bloodlight. Um, and this is sort of a love poem. And for me, it's also really a poem that ties together a lot of important themes for me. Um, so I'm going to start with that. Land and body. Here, we have survived another year. Take this bounty, our love, the resistance we feel between our teeth as seeds crack and extend their pale finger selves into paper towel, then earth, buried alive so they may grow into green billowing. We will eat as a new promise, saute in garlic, olive oil, feed to one another as if to say, there is no distance between taking and giving. A ritual of regret carried out beside the deer head on the porch. Its skin flaked to sodden leather, dark as leaf mulch. And my hands have traced the pale trifold stitching of skull. And I have been in mud today. I have cleaned up shit, clotted through boxes of frozen chicken, leg after leg split and stacked like cordwood into the box, splintered bone, flesh-skinned pink, a cold meat. And your hands have set the cinder blocks for a woodshed, have split the kindling, have dug the grave for the dog who lies rotting against ledge rock, four feet down in a frost heave, waiting until the irises spread up over his brindled, poisoned bloom, his cancer-chewed paw, his canine shining white as the moon that slips naked to run against our snow-spread lawn as we stand in front of the door, your arms folding me into you until I feel it, our hardness, the bicep and bruise of all the sap buckets we have lifted and poured, every bag of grain hauled, bale of hay thrown, animals we have mended and killed, tasted, tricked to the slaughter, every potato forked from the ground, each nail pounded, the boards above and below us, how all of it binds us, grafts us, one into the other, our freshly harrowed skin. So I'm going to read, I'm looking. Sorry, I'm going to read something I don't read very often from this first book. Um, there's a whole sequence. I've been thinking, um, you know, on this theme of, of, of beauty and brutality. Um, I recently lost, um, a couple weeks ago, I lost, um, my cat, who I've loved for a very long time, my 16-year-old cat. And then this past <clears throat> weekend, I got a kitten, um, who's crazy and very cool, and I'm sad and happy at the same time. Um, and I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, because my veterinarian said he might come tonight, mm -hmm. and I don't see him here, but I decided I would read animal poems anyway in the hopes that he was coming, and now I'll read them <laughs> because that's what I was thinking. So this, um, there's a whole sequence of different kinds of elegies that run through this first book, like elegy acts. Um, but this one is elegy as now. And this is for um, the dog, who my dog Mishka, who is an English Mastiff, who showed up in that first poem um, as, as already dead in that last poem. Elegy is now. Finally, I wash the dishes. I'm drizzling soap into yogurt containers. When you come in, 
the spotted salamander on your glove. I found him in the grave. The salamander stares at me, eyes the blackest beads I've ever seen. You set it in the brown bowl on the table, a splash of water. I use the steamer basket for a lid. I want to keep the salamander and name it after the dog. You go out to dig more grave to make it a little longer. I will keep washing dishes. I didn't keep the salamander, I put it back. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> um, and so the other thing is, I'll read one more from this book. Um, when I was writing this book, I was beginning my life as a homesteader, and I was discovering that you know, there are all these incredible, beautiful moments, but there are also these days where everything goes wrong. And, mm -hmm. and especially when you're dealing with animals and raising animals, sometimes what goes wrong is really horrendous. Um, and poems have been a place for me where I can go um, to deal with that, you know, to have some accountability and also to make something beautiful out of, of what is horrible, right? Um, so this book started to fill up with a lot of dead animal poems. And my mother said, Julia, could you please just stop writing dead animal poems? Nobody <laughs> wants to read this. And um, good daughter that I am, I wrote this poem in response, which I affectionately refer to as the mother of all dead animal poems. <laughs> it's sort of a dead animal list poem. When to dispatch, when it finds its way into the hen house, when it quills the dog, when she snags her leg in the fence and the others smell her blood before you do, when it gnaws the siding off your house at 3 a.m., when it builds its dam in the road, when you crush his hindquarters with your car, when she births her calf, then lies head lolling into the grass, too weak to stand, too weak to nurse. After three days, when it won't eat, won't drink, won't lie, when an ear flip no longer holds off flies, when there's cancer in the bone, in the heart, when ribs snap, when lungs puncture, when the tail uncurls, when he breaks his back, barn straw clinging as he stumbles up the hill to sleep on your porch. When it's bleeding in your bathtub, after a week, after he pisses himself, pisses blood. When it comes to you on three legs, when she wants to die at your feet, when he tries to bite back. Then you step into night, gather strength to the back of your hand, already the warm heft of now slung over your shoulder. Then you get your gun. And I should say that in the book, these appear in the opposite. These poems are side by side in the book, but I read them in the opposite order that they appear in the book. Gosh, I haven't read that one out loud in a while, and I'm feeling things. <laughs> I was telling Gretchen that my idea of poetry is to just sort of walk around in the world feelings first, mm -hmm. and then to try to build a house out of my feelings, out of words, and then just sit inside it, right? I don't know if that makes any sense, but... <laughs> I'm gonna read, do I have time to read anything else? Yeah, it'll, it'll make a nice little sweet sound. And then if you're, if you're ready, great. If you're not, okay. I'm gonna read I'm gonna read like two poems from newer poems. Um, but I'm gonna figure out what to read because everything's so sad and I don't know if I have anything less sad. Um, Well, while you're looking, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
um, Julie and I have done several um, readings together, and um, at one of the readings we were at, um, somebody said, well, you make living a rural life sound really awful. Um, and Julia's response, um, she's always so smart, uh, was that, you know, this, this beauty and brutality dichotomy, right? There's so much beauty and so much joy in living a rural life and living with animals and doing really hard work that can also be really dangerous work. But you don't get, you don't get one, you don't get one without the other, right? So this, this sadness comes with the beauty. And I was reading a wonderful book recently by J David James Duncan. Some of you might know him as the author of The Brothers K or The River Y. Mm. But I was reading some of his nonfiction. I was reading this book called God Laughs and Plays, which is, he calls them unchurched sermons. And they're about his relationship with the natural world. And he quoted somebody who said, he quoted somebody who's a physician saying, you know, there's a pill for grief. And he's like, what is it? And, he's, and the physician says, grief. So there's no way out of it. Oh, that's beautiful. So read your sad poems. OK. <laughs> so I'm going, to read, um, I'm going to read this poem, which has changed a little bit on me over the I, I recently revised this, even though I thought it was done a long time ago. And then I rewrote it last summer. And now I've rewritten it again. Um, Gretchen and I were talking, one of the things we were talking about on the way here was being willing to embarrass ourselves as writers. Um, and what it means, you know, why we do it and what it means. And so I'm going to read this poem that has some embarrassing things in it and is also really sad and about animals. <laughs> um, Study, this is called Study in Epigenetic Memory, a Meditation on Parasitic Infection. And it starts with a little note, which I will read you. Ascarisum, also called the large pig round worm, or the large white worm, is a species of parasitic round worm that infects pigs and wild boars worldwide. Cousin to the giant Ascarisum, is the microscopic C. elegans nematode. Researchers have manipulated the C. elegans to produce a fluorescent protein, which creates a distinct green glow when the worm is transported to warmer climates. When returned to its native cold, this glow remains for up to 14 generations. C. elegans is also notable for the singular blue light it emits at expiry, a phenomenon known as death fluorescence, which is death fluorescence is the name of the manuscript in progress that I'm reading from. The long lashed, almost human orb of the pig's eye swivels into a white squeal of panic wheelbarrowing as I grab the shoat's hawk's firm and don't let go until the syringe pierces flesh and all the ivermectin empties beneath the skin of his straining neck. When a pig begins to cough, we know there's worms in the lungs. Untreated and infestation will cause pneumonia, hepatitis, a general condition of wasting known as ill thrift. But of course, facts like this don't change anything. It's my job to hold on. A pig will fight hard to get away from me. It's my job to hold tight. Knuckles locking as I bring this around to the matter at hand which is how beautiful our fear can look. Conjunctivitis bluing the pig's eye to gemstone, milky aquamarine, fire opal, selenite, angelite, always some glowing jewel at the heart of the damage we carry, the pain we pass on without intention, hurt carried deep inside ourselves, so often invisible, 
until it isn't. Like that time I looked down before I flushed and saw my shit had a writhing white tail. That's what I mean, what I want to talk about. The kind of shame you can't shake no matter how hard you scrub under your fingernails. No matter that one-sixth of the world's population is carrying it too. A scarisuum, round worm, hidden everywhere in the earth we're all living on each day. A natural cycle of spring rain and mud, eggs transferred into the soft, dark heart of the soil or found clinging to plant matter. The harm we harbor in our own bodies without knowing. The hosts we become, unexpected homes for pathogens, Word the vet utters on the phone. After a week of pneumonia, penicillin injections, the piglet refusing food and water, weakening as his tail uncurls and flies gather along seeping lids until the vet says, you've done all you can. And there's nothing else left but the gun and the thrash, the grain sack and the stain that oozes now with its warm stink of blood, shit, flesh, as I tender my naked legs through blackberry canes to set the piglet beneath the leaves and leave him there for the coyotes to feed. Standing among the bramble, wondering how did we get here and how do I trace our way back? Hands quaking, my own eyes wheeling, brown as rot, searching for something, anything, to string us all back together. String some beauty to this mess, some light so blue, so brilliant, it's like the sky has swallowed the earth. And I will end there, my sad poems. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Yeah. I think so many of the things that Julia writes about as a poet are also the things that I write about in this book, which is uh, partly about I mean, um, I like to think of the nonfiction I write as having lots of narrative strands that are braided together. And one of the narrative strands is just the stuff that happened on this farm that my partner and I had for 20 years. Um, raising chickens, uh, raising goats, milking goats, seeing goats die, sending goats to the butcher, you know butchering chickens, um, all kinds of things that, all kinds of beautiful and, and hard things about living with animals. Making maple syrup, foraging for mushrooms in the woods, growing our own food, all kinds of wonderful things. So that's one of the narrative strands in this book, Woods Queer. Another of the narrative strands in this book is about um, my relationship with my partner and um, what it's like to be a queer person in rural Maine. So I want to um, just tell you a little bit about sort of the, the double meaning of the title. And then I want to read from a little bit from one of the essays. Um, and then we can open it up to questions. Um, but when you're a writer, you don't often have control over what the title of your book becomes. So when I was first writing this book, I wanted it to be called With the Animals, because I'm sort of um, um, enamored of Walt Whitman and Walt Whitman's beautiful um, lines from um, Song of Myself about, I could turn a wild and live with animals. They are so placid and serene. They're not like, they're, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just paraphrasing. They're not like humans. They don't go worshiping things and trying to make money and making themselves famous, right? So I wanted to call it With the Animals. And then I wanted to call it um, rural, rural Hours, after the Susan Fenimore Cooper book, Rural Hours. Yeah, I'm always casting back into literature for my titles. Um, but when it came down to it, um, the title that the publisher wanted was Woods Queer. Um, and um, 
I guess I was a little reluctant at first because I kind of didn't want the word queer to be on the front of my book. And boy, if that doesn't say internalized homophobia, I don't know what does. So anyway, there's a double, a double meaning to the title. And I didn't know until I moved to Maine that there's this phrase in New England for someone who's like lived in the woods for too long or like someone who could just live in a cabin in the woods without electricity kind of like Julia forever and be completely happy right so that's a person who's a bit woods queer right or they've gone woods queer um, and there are um, instances in literature where you can find this right if you were doing research for the Oxford um, dictionary and they asked you to research the first known use of the of the term woods queer um, you would find it you might find it in in um, in maybe 18th century England or you might find it in 19th or 19th century you know North America but anyway so there's the book is partly about just my absolute um, love and devotion and connection to the natural world so I think if there are probably a lot of you in this audience who are also woods queer. So woods queers unite. Um, there's also the meaning of the title, which is what it's like to be queer, what it's like to be an LGBTQ person and living in rural Maine. So I want to read you an essay. Since it is Pride Month still for just a few more days, June is Pride Month, I want to read you uh, from the essay called Woods Queer 2. Um, okay, here we go. We didn't generate much garbage at the three o'clock cat farm. That was the name of our farm. Everything from waxed milk cartons to bacon grease seemed to have a second life in our world. So it was not often that I hauled the trash to the bottom of the steep driveway for pickup by the town of Jay. When I did, I put, I put the big blue plastic bin in the garden cart and wheel it down, leaning back hard on the handles so the cart would not get away from me and careen down the driveway onto East Jay Road. I park it off to the side of the drive where in winter it would be out of the way of the plow and where in early summer lupin and wild daisies bloomed on the hill. I never worried about the cart being stolen. I left it with the bin in it until I was ready to push it back up the drive and set the empty bin back in its place in the corner of the barn. One day I went to retrieve the cart and the empty bin. I noticed strange drawings on its side. I'd walked across the road to grab the mail from our large rural delivery box, the kind with the red flag on it that you lift to let the mail carrier know you have letters to send. So this is where I'm doing a shout out to people in like Manhattan who don't know what a rural delivery box is, okay? So I know you guys all know that. And I noticed similar drawings on the mailbox and the wooden post. Upon closer inspection, I discovered them to be erect cartoon penises with little sets of hairy testicles attached, scrawled in thick marker. Some even had little squirts of sperm popping out of their heads. I could have been amused, which I was a little, and I could have been angry, which I was a little. But instead, mostly, I was afraid. This was during the last time Maine went through a statewide vote on whether to allow same-sex couples to marry, the second since I'd moved to the state with my partner in 2000. Maine first prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation in its Human Rights Act in 2005, and efforts to take it out of the act were immediate but failed. Maine first allowed domestic partnerships between same-sex couples in 2009, but the law was overturned in a people's veto referendum before it even took effect. The measure went onto the state ballot again in 2012 and passed with 52% of votes. So for the time being anywhere, anyway, queer Mainers have civil rights protections and the right to wed, although there always seemed to be someone who wanted to make us illegal. Ruth and I had supported the first effort by volunteer phone canvassing. The second time around, we had a sign at the end of our driveway supporting marriage equality that read, yes on, vote yes on one. We had debated putting the sign out, afraid it would draw negative attention, but we decided to do it anyway. Such a small thing, and yet because we were lesbians in rural Maine, we felt trepidation. I won't say we were courageous to put the sign out, 
but it did require a certain amount of reckoning with possible consequences. It occurred to me that the graffiti on the garbage bin and mailbox might have been a response to our sign. Our neighbors at the end of the road, whom we considered our friends, they were old time Maine farmers, had a sign in their yard that urged voters in the opposite direction of ours. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Their sign made us feel at best unwelcome and a little betrayed. They know we're lesbians, right? I asked Ruth. I'm sure they do, she said. How could anyone know us and not want us to have the right to get married, I innocently thought. We're so nice, we're so normal. Do you think they put their sign out because we put our sign out? Whose sign was first, I asked Ruth. In what was the beginning of a long discussion about the efficacy and ethics of political signs. Were signs went, meant to advertise personal political opinions to change people's minds or to engage in ideological warfare with your neighbors. In the context of what was going on in the state, the graffiti on the garbage can and mailbox felt threatening. I thought I knew who had done it. One of our neighbor's boys was a bit of a rascal, but of course I couldn't be sure and I didn't know where it might lead if I approached his parents. I took pictures of the drawings and I decided to ask our lesbian and gay friends for advice. Their reactions ranged from calling the police to doing nothing. Our gay pediatrician friend who practiced at the local hospital convinced me to wait and see what might happen next. Boys get in this stage where they just need to draw genitalia on things, he said. He advised me to save the pictures I took, to scrub off the drawings, and not to call the cops or to talk to the parents. I followed his advice. I rubbed off what I could of the drawings, leaving a faint stubborn trace behind. Nothing more came of it, but it was a taste, a rare one, thankfully, of what it felt like to be singled out, to be otherized, noticed, harassed for being different, for being queer. So I go on in the essay to talk about um, how, you know, the, the opposite of that feeling of of, of feeling that, dis, that unease and that feeling of being um, outcast or ostracized was this feeling of community that we were able to build with um, our queer friends. And I tell the story of first arriving in Farmington in 2000 and doing some shopping and then coming back to my <laughs> Subaru and finding this flyer tucked under the wiper and it said, out to dinner potluck, please come, and you know, a date and an address. I thought, how did they even, how did they know this about me? But of course, everyone, you know, you, you develop this thing called gaydar. You've probably heard of it. You just know, right? So we started to develop this community, um, potlucks, and we developed something called the left bank of the Sandy River Gay and Lesbian Cultural Salon, where we would read books and watch movies together. Um, it's it just a fancy term for a reading group, basically. Um, so, um, let me see um, what I want to read you here. Um, the end of this. Oh, I wanted to tell you, I wanted to, um, we had these potlucks, um, and that's sort of old school um, community development is potlucks. So I drew, I, ha I had the um, privilege of doing the drawings for this book too. And so I drew a picture of the potluck table, right? Which is always such a joy. So um, this is what I want to read to you. Um, okay. Even with all the joy and camaraderie of our small queer community in rural Maine, even with our community building efforts and the, all the support for one another, there was still fear. Most of us were out in our jobs and personal lives. We were out in the community gathering weekly for years at a local restaurant where anyone paying any attention knew exactly who we were. But there was still a very real sense of vulnerability and a need to stay not quite hidden, but just under the radar. At one of our salons, excited about a memoir we'd discussed, I asked those gathered what they thought about putting together an anthology of stories from our group about what it was like to be queer in rural Maine. It would be so exciting, I thought, and important. I was thrilled by my own idea. We could all tell our stories, which I think of as being very empowering, right? But naively, I wasn't prepared for the negative response of my friends, 
who thought the idea too self-revealing and possibly dangerous. What was I thinking? Again, with the graffiti on the garbage cans and mailbox, I became a little afraid. And again, the internalized homophobia came crawling back out of the darkness, opportunistic, always looking for a way to slither into my consciousness and encourage me to be invisible. So that leads me to my little mini um, monologue about um, the importance of telling our stories. Um, and um, a shout out to librarians and teachers, right? There's some teachers in the audience, librarians in the audience. Um, librarians um, are, I've heard, libra I've heard one, libra one queer librarian, I know, <laughs> um, say that she is a librarian because she believes that books save people's lives, because books saved her life. And she was talking specifically about being a young queer person in rural Maine and going to a library and finding herself there, right? And having a librarian who had a, a good enough gaydar to know what this young person needed in order to help her understand who she was and understand there were other people like her in the world. So librarians, teachers, really vital in that way of helping young people, old, older people, doesn't matter how old you are. I didn't come out till I was in my 30s and I was still looking for community, looking for myself in literature. So connecting people with stories. And then the power of telling your own story, right? I teach creative writing at University of Maine Farmington and I primarily teach nonfiction. And in my, for in my beginning nonfiction class, um, one of the things that students always say to me is, my life is really boring. I don't have anything to write about. So the first thing we do is they, they have an assignment to write a 40-page, what I call boot camp autobiography. Mm -hmm. And they have two weeks to write it. Mm -hmm. So they can't worry too much about whether it's beautiful or perfect or not. They just get it on the page, right? And then what we do is we look through that and we say, what are the stories you have to tell? What are the stories that came up out of the darkness or out of nothing? You didn't even remember what they were. What are the stories you have to tell? And then we start picking out those little tiny stories and telling them, right? So I know a lot of you are here tonight because you're readers, um, readers, teachers, librarians, but a lot of you are here because you, you feel um, a desire to write. Um, so I just want to affirm for you no matter how boring your life is, <laughs> it's not. And you have a story to tell. And whatever story that is, um, start writing it. Get it out there. Because you never know who is going to find inspiration in your story or connection through your story or whose lives, you might, your, whose lives your story might connect with or save. So. That's the end of my monologue. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, one of the most fun parts of being a writer in my book is talking about writing with other people and hearing other people's stories. So and I, th I think maybe I won't speak for you, but Maybe you would say the same. Yeah. yeah, I like that part. Yeah. So we have lots of time left for hearing what you're thinking about, questions you might have. I mean, and if you don't have questions, I have questions for Julia. Um, uh, so, but let's hear yours. Well, this is for Julia. A couple of months ago, you read a poem to the legislature that uh, Craig Hickman Yes. I haven't seen that. I'd like to see that newsletter. He did tell me he was going to do that. But yeah, that was really fun. Um, so I was asked to to be honorary clergy for the um, for opening the the Senate session, um, and that was I did that on. Yeah, like about a month ago, and that was, um, 
I thought it was really great that they're opening that up and having um, beyond regular clergy members to have poets and things like that do that. Um, so it was a lot of fun. I wrote a Sistina for them. Do you have that? And I actually you, do have it. Would you be willing okay. to read it? I would be willing to that read it. That would be really cool. Sarah, Sarah saying, what's a Sistina? Oh, so a Sistina is a poem that is written in six line stanzas, sextets, um, and each you so basically what you're doing is you pick six words that you want to end your lines with and then those end words shuffle in a different order so you write six stanzas each with a different rotation of the end line of the end words and then the final um stanza is a tercet three lines with all six words again in a prescribed order I want to ask a question for you. Yes. Um, what made you choose that? How did you know what to choose for a poem? That's a big... So I didn't feel that I had any poems that were appropriate for this uh, exactly. Um, like even when my poems felt spiritual, they would also, I don't know, have pig shit in them or something. And it just, nothing felt appropriate. You know, I veto, I went through everything and I vetoed all of them. So I decided that I was gonna write something for the occasion. And I thought it would be fun to really play with form, you know, since there was that opportunity to, um, to do, you know, to, to bring a poem instead. And so I thought it'd be fun to really play with the poet's toolbox in that sense. And then also when I think of prayer, I think of it because I am a very secular person. I think of it as something that is continually changing and evolving. And so the Sistina felt like a really good formal fit for me, mm -hmm. if, that, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, I think you'll see a little bit in the poem why I wrote it as a Sistina, hopefully. Um, I hope I'm not lying when I said I brought it. Because now, oh, here it is. Okay. Whoops. There we go. Oh, this is the version where I, okay. That's a little added on. I can read it. <laughs> Prayer after another hard winter. Now all I crave is the verdant alchemy of trees. I can offer no blessing that doesn't begin or end in limbs clamoring skyward. Leaves so green when you breathe their scent, you can't distinguish sweet from sharp. The cut branches bright bubble of sap at the end of my pruning shears. This heart is a woods road marked by so many footprints in soft set mud. These hands are farmer's hands, calloused among the plums, lopping shoots of blossoms, pink and pungent with promise. Here is what I know about blossom. It fills you as fast as it fades, a perfume lingering as petals wither, blessing and loss lifting into the air together a scent you could hold in your hands. It's that palpable, the urge to survive, our fear of being crushed by all this green beauty, fear that maybe we'll fail to open ourselves wide enough, that the heart can't possibly bear another flood or windstorm, spring snow squalls that cut through the daffodils, bowing their yellow heads to the earth that cuts and splinters a branch from the apple tree I just planted, already blossom heavy in my mind, already picturing the black Oxford held like a dark heart in my palm. Each bite of pulp and sugar and tannin and juice, a blessing spilling the mouth. For perhaps prayer is simply a spilling over that green surge of peeper song that overflows my hilltop ball and leaves my hands trembling under the cacophony of it all. Sometimes I have the urge to hand this too much feeling off, to pass it along and stop walking the world cut side out. Though I don't, 
I won't. There is too much to do. The soil green already with weeds to be pulled. Eggplant seedlings purpling into blossom on the picnic table, ready to be planted, which is the only kind of blessing I know. Tuck everything I love into the soft clench of earth. Root my heart to the page. Against the blank white page, a thicket of vines. My heart will grow tendrils. Words coil sinew by emerald sinew. Take my hand, stranger. Let's go st grow stranger together here in this bramble. What a blessing to know that somewhere someone is listening. At the lilac bush, I cut a thick bouquet, then pound the stem ends with a hammer. Blossoms scatter my countertop. The split bark peels back to expose green skin, heartwood. I'm told the flowers drink deeper that way. I'm still green to these tricks, but learning. I'm grateful for the chance to feel new heart hungry for cycle and season, even after all we've lost. Can we blossom another word for prayer from our pain? Can we stand hand in hand and try? My people don't believe, don't name death when we pray for those cut from us. We don't name our grief. We just keep unfurling our blessing louder, higher, past our own green song, past the bowl of the sky, hands aloft, hearts in our hands, knowing each wound, each place we've been cut, is a spot where blossom might set, our voice, our work, rising as blessing. about the difficulty of when something happens, of responding when one of the consequences could be even more backlash against you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to guess that within the queer community that there's a complete spectrum of opinion on what's the best thing to do when that happens. <coughs> how do you all talk about that and how do you resolve it? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, and you're absolutely right that there is a spectrum of responses. Um, um, some people's response to um, uh, you know, a challenge to their identity or selfhood is to just uh, hide more, right? And some people's response to a challenge like that is to um, organize a pride march, right? <laughs> Um, and um, you know, and some people's resp I mean, some people, it, some people can uh, write books about it, um, and some people can't. Um, and it, it's a, this isn't answering your question exactly, but I mean, one of the things that I think about a lot is that there there used to be a lot more ways to. I mean, even this salon that we had and this out-to-dinner potluck has kind of unraveled a little bit. And there used to be um, gay and lesbian bars that a person could go to. Like, I think there was one in Waterville, and there were some in Portland. And they don't, even, they don't exist anymore. There used to be a tea dance that people went to somewhere. Um, I can't even, oh, a gunquit, I think. Um, so there used to be more sort of overt uh, communities that you could be a part of, right? And go and meet people like yourself and um, build these kinds of coalitions, which are very important. And I think that as, um, as our political uh, landscape has changed slightly, you know, that there, there, there it's, um, 
there, there's this perception that it's really safe to be out now and that everybody's okay with queerness. And I mean, you talk to high schoolers and, and they're just like, they, this isn't even register for them as something to be concerned about or a way to differentiate between people and discriminate against people, right? Um, but there's the, the, but there's still very much a landscape. Uh, we still v live very much in a heteronormative culture. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do. So it concerns me that these small, safe places for queer people are disappearing, right? Um, so that, I guess it's not a way of answering your question. It's just a way of talking about how, how complicated this landscape is. Um, and so I think um, the fact that there are fewer uh, spaces like that means that um, LBGTQ people gather in community less, which is not a good thing, I don't think. Because um, it means we don't talk to each other or form culture or support each other. Yeah. But everybody makes these decisions based on their own level of comfort. <clears throat> yeah. I, re I recall from the, the campaigns for gay marriage, um, and sometimes uh, one might think that the advocates for it were extreme enough that it would cause a negative reaction, and also same thing from the other side. But ultimately, the campaign that was on the winning side was that spectacular <coughs> advertising campaign that was done with families talking I remember about that. family members. Yeah, and I remember I that. Just, that was such, so anybody, no matter what feeling they thought they had, looked at those ads and said, these are nice people. Yeah, and, um, they're so nice, they're so normal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so somewhere along the line, uh, where you have to make a decision as to how to respond, somebody figured out what I think was a really a spectacular strategy. Yeah, I do think that was a great strategy, yeah. It was also the truth. Yes, and also and the truth, right. Off yeah. to the best way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you think, though, no, I think, I'm, I'm a straight person, so what do I know? But I, it feels to me like it's more accepted. So perhaps people do not feel that they've got to, you know, come together <coughs> just, you know, that they can come together in wider circles. Of yeah. Yeah. I mean, that certainly is one of the theories, right? That we, do, we just don't need that anymore. I don't need sure it. Yeah. It's not as, maybe it's just more accepted. Yeah. 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 I have a friend who comes to visit me who lives in New York and uh, she's gay and has been since we were in college mm -hmm. a million years ago. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> and she is does not feel in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's been thinking about coming to live here at least part of the year. Hmm. But it worries her that she might not find a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's that side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'll just tell you a, a quick story, and I know you have a question in the green, but um, this is about, um, you know, queer community. So there was a period of time in the in the sixties and seventies when there when there were a lot of um, women only communities being formed, and some of those women only communities were lesbian only communities, um, and that you know one of them, I mean, and that has become really that's become problematic over the years as um, we're becoming more. Uh, aware as a culture to the concept of gender fluidity and transgender identity and so forth, but there was a place in New Hampshire called, okay, I'm going to forget what it was, but it was a women's only um, hotel, like one of those fancy summer New Hampshire hotels, right, mm -hmm. the, where 
fancy people from New York came up and spent the summer in New Hampshire and Maine. Anyway, um, and I'll remember the name of it in a, in a minute, but, um, and my partner Ruth is a songwriter and she was invited to go to the Highlands Inn, that was it, to perform, to do a couple of folk uh, concerts. And we had two young friends, and they're under 30, uh, who live in Farmington, who were a lesbian couple, and one of them came along to do drums for Ruth. And we just think, oh my gosh, young lesbians are so hip, so cool. They don't need potlucks, you know, they don't need the Highlands Inn. But these two friends came and um, they sat on the couch together and held hands, right? And in this in this community, and afterwards, they said they said to me and Ruth, like these these ancient lesbians with gray hair, it was so wonderful to just be able to sit on the couch and hold hands. And so that reminded me that these spaces are still really vital. It's not that anyone, if two women were holding hands here, no one would like kick them out. But there's a difference between. <clears throat> this space and a space where you're surrounded by other people who are who you have a lot in common with. Anyway, I feel like we've kind of hijacked this conversation, <laughs> but, but, it's <laughs> but it's fascinating. But it's fascinating, yeah. So, um, yeah, let's. You had your hand up, yeah. Well, I felt as though um, that incident once it was over, it just kind of dropped. But were there further issues? Like, did you ever find out who did it? Well, you know what. After this book came out, this the woman, the mother, she emailed me and she said, my son has an apology to make to you. And I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and the son never came to me in person, but it was clear that she knew that he had done it and he knew that we knew. So I feel good about it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, my question actually is kind of like going back to the beginning. I liked, I love what you said about like engaging the world and going out the world with your like emotions out, you know, and like experiencing the world like with your emotions out. Um, and then also, you know, the whole beauty um, and brutality aspect of um, of like this way of life, right? So my question is for both of you. Um, like, which essay of yours, maybe which poem of yours, do you feel um, was the hardest to write, like, emotion-wise? Like, it had so much emotion for you um, that maybe it was hard to write, but also felt really beautiful to write. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's my question. What a great question. That's a great question. You have so many poems like that. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble deciding, because I have a lot of poems like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and both of you wrote, um, you know, it wrote about really difficult things. And some of your essays really like hit with like that must have been really difficult, you know, to go through and then to write about it. And the things that you choose to write your poems about, you know, you're like, I have this whole bunch of dead animal poems, but it's like each one of those impacted you enough to say I need to write something about that. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder. One that I can point to, and I, I think, I mean, this is just, it's it's like a, a thing that I keep doing over and over again, right? Um, but one I can think point to because it was particularly difficult in terms of process, um, which is a poem that I started writing after my grandmother died in 2017, and which I initially wrote as kind of this four-page um Rant. I mean, it was an elegy, but it was also became highly political. Um, she died at the end of, of January 2017, and before, and I started writing the poem in February at the Association of Writers and Writing Programs Conference, which was in D.C. Um, so all of this was, you know. Um, shortly after after the inauguration and before my grandmother died not the last thing she said but one of them was i'm okay but the country isn't mm -hmm. so i knew that was going to be like the title of this piece 
and I spent, you know, the first version of it was like this four page, just like monsoon of emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I couldn't get it published anymore because it was, just, <laughs> I still haven't gotten this thing published, but I don't care anymore. Um, it's changed so much. It's a different reason now. Um, now I can't get it published because it is a heroic sonic crown. So it is 15 sonnets, um, each linking. So the, the last line becomes, a version of the last line becomes the, the first line of the next. Um, it is also, and then there's a final, there's a 15th sonnet that's composed of the first, ten, first lines of all the preceding sonnets in order. Um, and the other thing that happens is it starts off in, as a Petrarchan sonnet. So it is the Petrarchan sonnet scheme, the first eight sonnets, so the, which is so, so the octave. I'm, I'm going to write nerd out for a second, yeah. um, if you don't mind. I love this. All right, love so, this so the, the Petrarchan sonnet, um, it has a rhyme scheme that goes A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, right? And that's the octave. And then the sextet is E, F, G, E, F, G. So I started this out as a, as a Petrarchan and the first eight are in the Petrarchan rhyme scheme. And then at, right, so the, where, the, where the octet meets the sextet is, called, is the volta, right? This is where it turns. And in the case of this poem, I dropped form at that point. And so the sex, the final six, and then the last one are unrhymed. Um, so it was this whole thing for, I wrote, you know, first I wrote this poem. I didn't know what to do with it. I sat with it maybe a year, knowing that it was going to turn into something else, but not knowing. I talked to a friend of mine who, and I said, I wrote this poem, and it's huge, and I don't know what to do with it. And she said, you know, try writing it as a crown of as sonnets. So I started that, I wrote those first eight, and then I got stuck again, and I didn't know where to go. The narrative portion of what I've written was, you know, I'd sort of moved through that, but I wasn't done, and I didn't know. And then um, I was in Paris, actually, and I picked up, um, uh, what's the name of that famous English language bookstore in Paris? Shakespeare, Shakespeare and Company, right. So I was there. And I picked up a copy of Terence Hayes' son American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. Mm -hmm. And these are unrhymed sonnets, right? And so that gave me this permission to just break the whole rhyme scheme, right? And let grief break form, right? Mm -hmm. Because we make this container, you know, that's what form is, it's this container. And then at that point, my grief you know, it flows over the container, and so the container <clears throat> no longer holds. Um, mm -hmm. I learned so much about, you know, I was afraid of sonnets before I wrote this, so I learned a lot in writing. And so I would say that I wanted, I'm naming that one because I think it's not just that I turn my grief into something, but it turned it into something that then taught me something that changed me a little bit as a writer. Can you come and repeat all of that in my English class? Oh, sure. That would be fun. <laughs> that would be fun. I'm going to be reaching out. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think I identified four of the words in your sestina, but I would like to know what the six words okay. in your sestina are. So the words are, which ones did you identify? <laughs> well, I could be wrong. <laughs> No one's going to judge. I got blossom, prayer, green, and blessing. So prayer is actually not one of them. But there are other repetition. Like, I started getting into the repetition thing. So mm -hmm. um, blessing, green, cut, heart, hands, blossom. Mm -hmm. I got 50%. Fun. <laughs> Gretchen, I'd love to hear your answer to convert this question. Okay. Because, I mean, and if I'm you don't have an answer, I have one in my head, but you know what? <laughs> I, I, was think, I was thinking of it. Um, yeah. So, um, the title of the, the subtitle is Crafting a Sustainable Rural Life. And uh, again, I didn't come up with that subtitle, the publisher did. 
Um, and I, um, so sometimes when I, when I do readings, I want to talk about what that means, crafting a sustainable rural life, because it makes it sound like, um, like a climate change book or something like that, right? Um, but a lot of what I mean by sustainable, what I mean by sustainable is a life you can keep on living, a life that you can keep on living sustainably on the planet, in your place, right? In your relationships with other people and in your relationship with yourself. So, um, a lot of what, um, one of the narrative threads in this book is my relationship with my partner, Ruth. How do you sustain a relationship over the long term? You know, you meet, you fall in love, everything's bliss for the first six months, and then you start after dealing with stuff, you know, what bugs you about them, whatever. Well, one of the embarrassing things I write about is that I had an affair. Um, what it happens to a relationship when you have an affair? How do you, how do you figure out what to do? Do you want to come back to the relationship? If you do, how do you repair it? You know, so one of the hardest things to write about, um, sorry, <laughs> um, what's that repair, right? Um, and, uh, I remember a couple of things that Ruth said that were just so stunning. Um, one of them was, um, she said, um, I realized after we went through all this that <clears throat> um, that our relationship isn't a fairy tale anymore. So she, she said, one of the good things that happened was that I realized it's not a fairy tale anymore. Um, it's not perfect. And I realized, she said to me, I realized I can, I can live without you. But I don't want to. Um, so that was hard. I and mean, it's also hard because when you're writing memoir, you're writing, um, if you're really true to the intimacy and the grit of it, sometimes you write about other people in difficult ways. And you really need their buy-in, <laughs> you know. So I'm really grateful that Ruth bought in to this and was willing to have this story told. So another piece of that sustainable life thing is um, we were raising goats and chickens. And it was all jolly good fun. But I decided that ah, I really want this animal raising to be sustainable. I want to be able to make money raising animals so that I can make, you know, I can sell goat cheese or milk or eggs or whatever, and then we can use, we can fold that back into the operation, right, and we can have a sustainable operation. Um, and so I had this, I hatched this plan to breed our goats earlier in the season so that they would have their babies earlier in the spring so that I could sell the babies in what's called the Easter market, you know, for um, celebratory dinners for people, usually people who are of different um, geographic and ethnic traditions eat baby goat in the spring. So our goats gave birth early in the one of the coldest springs of the year. Plus, that you know that was difficult. That was traumatic for everybody. Plus, I had decided that my goats were wasting too much hay. So again, I'm thinking sustainability, right? I don't want them to waste hay. So I built them special hay ricks so they wouldn't waste so much hay. So not as much hay was falling on the floor of their stalls, and so the stall floor got wet. Again. <laughs> um, Sure. But so one of our young goats was her first birth, got mastitis. And um, I partly blame myself, you know, um, because I was trying to save money and create this sustainable operation. Thank you. <laughs> and um, she got sick and she died. We had to put her down. And the vet, 
you know, I asked Lavette, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? She said, I think your barn looks great. It's very clean. You did everything you could. But I just still felt like this man. I completely betrayed these animals. So that's my answer. Thank you for sharing <laughs> both of those. Yeah. All of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My daughter has 14 year olds, little boy goats. Mm -hmm. And they have them because they love goats. Yeah. And they got them at two weeks old. Mm -hmm. And they fed the dog fed them. Yeah. You know, and just brought them up as pets. I know. Yeah, but in the middle of the winter, one of them. Got too cold when they were by and Gary had to go out and shoot. Yeah. And it's, it's a tough thing. It's really, it's really, really hard. hard. And they cry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, one of the beautiful things when the vets came and they put the goat down and they, they hauled her across the snow in a sled and stuffed her in the back of their Subaru, you know, to bring her to their place where she could be cremated. Um, well, Ruth and I did a little ceremony, and Ruth played the guitar, and I wrote a poem, and we cried, and the vets cried, you know. And they told us these wonderful stories about going to people's farms and these wonderful rituals that people would come up with to, to mark the passing of their animals, and it, it just it felt sad and beautiful at the same time. I realize in retrospect that I should have dedicated my first book um, to Dr. F. Cooper, actually. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was our vet, too. Yeah. Not this, he was, by the time this goat died, Dr. Cooper later, had, right? had yeah. passed, but yeah, he was an amazing fellow. Thank you for the tissues. <laughs> I'd like to ask how you both came to me. <laughs> um, why well, I ended up in Maine because I fell in love with someone from Maine. So um, we met in Pennsylvania, but and we in college, and we spent after I graduated, we spent a year driving around the country because we knew we wanted land somewhere. Um, so we decided we'd drive all around the country to figure out where we most wanted to be. And it turned out there wasn't anywhere else we most wanted to be except here. Mm -hmm. so. I also fell in love with someone who was um, a New Englander. Um, Ruth had, Ruth, we were living in Alaska and Ruth just thought Alaska was too, too unfriendly. <laughs> she wanted to come back to a landscape that felt more welcoming. So she wanted to come back and be near her family. So we did the same thing. We first moved to, uh, I got a job at the University of Maine Farmington first, which I'm very responsible in that way. Job first and then move later. And we first moved to Chesterville, Maine, and then um, moved to this farm in, near Jay. Um, so. We have that in common, too. <laughs> so it is a quarter to eight. Um, we've been having so much fun. The time has gone by really fast. But I think that um, maybe if there's one last question. If there's not, that's OK, too. No pressure. Go for it. Uh, I have a barrel full of questions, but I'll try to keep <laughs> uh, I've been teaching in Sweden for the last 26 years. Sweden, Maine? Uh, the country. OK. Uh, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I feel quite fortunate. I think Scandinavians are quite open, and you know, they deal with a lot of <clears throat> issues and um, current events in a sensible way. I also spend a few hours a week in my international school in the library. And I'm always working to, when the librarian asks about, Jim, you're American. What's your opinion on this? Should we bring it into the library? And I'm always, yes, bring it into the library. I was here the other day, <clears throat> and there's a book, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Mother Bruce, 
-hmm. with Goose drops out and oh, um, Ryan Higgins. So it's a yeah. Yeah. And it happens to be the son of a classmate of mine, high school classmate. And I heard about it. <coughs> and I sat here and I read it. I said, what in the world is because I was reading from Sweden, I was reading about censorship. You know, that this book had been banned in some schools, I'm not sure which states. Yeah. But I was just curious if you either of you have been touched with the censorship or yeah like, uh, has my has my book been banned anywhere well and i'm just <laughs> curious if you if you've had to deal with that for example you're speaking here to us probably a lot of educators um but do you ever speak at like high schools or college um, audiences and I, i'm just wondering how that if it has affected you yeah, I mean, I think about it most in my role as a librarian. Mm -hmm. um, so I think about it most in, in terms, I mean, I think about this all the time. Um, but I think about it most in my role as a librarian that, um, you know, that I, I have a small rural library that I'm filling with all kinds of different titles and that that's important to me, right? So, you know, I'm, I think most, you know, librarians these days are a little bit on edge and you just, you don't know, right? So you're always a little bit prepared to have that fight if you need to have it. Um, so I definitely am if I need to. I haven't had to, which is great, you know, but, but that, that sense of preparing for that, I think is something that probably all, all librarians feel these days, and probably all writers feel that these days. Personally, I don't. I don't think that I've had a lot of. Um, I don't know of any, you know, serious challenges to one of my books that have happened. Um, I will say, you know, I've done a fair amount of recording poems for the radio, and you're still not allowed to say shit on public radio. So, you know. <laughs> And that keeps showing up in my poems, right? Because it's just a farm word, right? But um, so there is that, yeah, the, the seven words that, you know, that George Carlin skipped, they still hold true, apparently. <laughs> so. What are the seven words? Um, shit, piss, oh gosh, can I remember the other six? So shit, piss, fuck, cocksucker, um, tits, you can't say tits. Um, what are the other two? Why am I doing this? Why did you talk me into doing this? This is being recorded. <laughs> that was like the question about the words in the Sistina. I just wanted to know. <laughs> All right, it's okay if you remember the others. So this question about censorship. Right, there, oh, there's six, there's seven, right? So well, I take one out. We'll have to take one. one out and do a Sistina. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's a prompt for anyone here who wants to try it. But I'll try it too. The forbidden Sistina. The forbidden Sistina. Yeah. Censorship Sistina. Um, so I'm not aware that there have ever been any um, challenges to any of my work. Um, but as a teacher, I have to say that I'm always, um, I'm always choosing you know, okay, I'm, I'm fessing up. Um, I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to teach books that I know really well. Well, what I like to do is I teach books I want to read, um, whether I've read them and know all about them or not. Because I see my role as a teacher more as a as a guide. And we're all on this journey together, right? So this past semester in a nonfiction class I was teaching, we read three works that have been. Um, challenged, banned, censored. One was Gender Queer, the um, graphic novel that has gotten so much attention. One was Mouse by Art Spiegelman that has also been banned inexplicably. Mm -hmm. And also um, Fun Home by Alison Bechdel that has also been challenged. Um, and we talked about this in class with the students. And I said, well, you, you know, um, all three of these books have been challenged, have been banned in some places, and we had a long and very fruitful discussion about them. And I have to admit that there are some um, 
parts of gender queer that were that were really challenging for me, um, but um, students were really ready for it and really embraced it and were really grateful for it. And one of them just said, you know, if we don't engage with this stuff, how are we gonna how are we going to grow and learn and learn compassion and learn about difference and diversity? They were like, this is a no-brainer. Of course we should be reading this. Yeah. So it's a great question. Lee, how are we doing? Uh, you're great. You can, uh, if you have any closing comments you'd like to do, um, I guess before you do, I would just say, Thank you both so much, Julia and Gretchen. Very enjoyable evening. Um, and if you have any parting words, bits of wisdom you'd like to share with us, and then perhaps most importantly, um, how people can follow you and get in touch with you if you want them to, and, uh, uh, and if they would like to. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Yes, thank you very much for coming. Totally enjoyable, great evening. Always great to listen to Julia be brilliant too. And we both have books for sale if you would like. Um, you can also get our books in libraries, um, which is always also a great way to get yes. books. And we both have websites. I'm GretchenLegler.com and I think you're JuliaBowsman.com. Julia yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you again. Keep reading, keep writing. Keep Thank asking great questions. Does this library have either of your books? I don't know. Lee, do you know? I meant to look and I forgot to. But you, can I'm always, I'm sorry. you can always encourage them to get There is also a magnificent interlibrary loan in this There is. Yeah, yeah. Minerva has a beautiful <laughs> interlibrary loan system. Yeah, yeah. And so, there are plenty of copies of um, all your books in, this, uh, in Minerva. I know that the main state library yeah, is. Yeah. So. You can always, we can always get them here for you and then the more you, the more you borrow them, the more it puts a, I can put a bug in the ear of our director to purchase, okay. purchase them all. So, so or you can buy one here. Yes. <laughs> so thanks again, everybody, and thank you, Lee, and also to Richard, who was the one who organized our getting here. So, yeah, Richard. Yeah. yeah you're sure. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming. I did.